much for joining us. Hi, my name is Maria Corral. I'll be hosting the series. I'm the Community Integration Coordinator with the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs. Um, today we'll be giving you an overview of My City Academy as well as an overview of what we do in the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs and then we're welcoming and so happy to have Councilwoman Amanda Sawyer. Um, just to let you know the reason why Academy started was because as I was growing up and we saw this as well um, when Jamie was director and now with the team we've we've made the commitment that you know as we grow up sometimes all we do is pay our taxes as immigrants and children of immigrants and we don't really utilize all the services available to in the city so for in order for people to learn about that this specific webinar series is for community service navigators community service uh, providers and navigators to share this information with your community on how to actually access those services that they're going to need. Um, we will be providing parking lot sessions the same week of our sessions and those will be on Thursday. I'll invite you to that session if you're able to make it. Otherwise, if you have any questions, please make sure to email me. Um, and in addition to that, I want to make sure to remind everyone to please, please, please do the census. We'll be providing the web link at the end of this program, as well as with the follow-up documents. Um, we'll be, we're really trying to encourage our Denver residents to, to fill out the census. It's so important for so many different aspects of the city, um, as well as in our communities and in our neighborhoods to provide that funding, um, and just to be counting and for representation. Um, questions may be asked in the Q&A. Um, and also, please feel free to use your reactions, either the clapping, the thumbs up, if somebody asks you a question. We are recording all sessions, and they'll be posted to the city's YouTube channel, as well as our My City Academy webpage. It's my pleasure right now to introduce my director of my director, the director of the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, um, a team OT. Thank you, Maria, and thank you for setting all of this up. Um, I think everyone will really find the information and resources that are shared throughout this um, academy very useful to um, use with your community members. And so um, I am thankful that you all uh, made the time to get on. Um, this academy uh, one hour and hear about the resources and services that we have here at the city and county of Denver. So as Maria said, my name is Atim OT and I'm the director of the Immigrant and Refugee Affairs Office. We are part of the Human Rights and Community Partnership Agency within the city and county of Denver. Our office, and we actually have an acronym, which uh, we say is DOIRA, so it's D-O-I-R-A, was established in 2005. And our mission is really to promote the well being of immigrant and refugee communities and advocates for inclusive and meaningful integration into Denver's vibrant civic, economic, and cultural life. We really appreciate partnering with our government agencies, community based organizations, and residents to develop and implement policies, practices, and programs that influence the various paths of immigrant integration. So I'll just quickly um, just hit on a couple of our, well, really our five strategic areas where we focus our work. And if anyone has any questions, you can reach out to Maria, but you can also reach out to myself to stay engaged. And if you have any other questions about the, the areas that I discuss. So the first area is in advocacy. And this advocacy piece is we really like to, we want to focus on influencing local policy and decision-making practices that are inclusive of immigrant and refugee communities. And so this might look like recently we started uh, the Left Behind Workers Fund, and that's for folks who were left out of federal and state uh, relief aid. Or we have what's called the Denver Immigrant Legal Services Fund, and that is for individuals who uh, need legal services here in the city and county of Denver. 
We also try to work on municipal advocacy. So any sort of national, state, and also sometimes local immigration policies that, um, that are, um, uh, imply or have some sort of implication for our Denver immigrant and refugee communities, we are advocating uh, for those uh, policies and or how those policies might impact our communities. The second area of focus is capacity building. So programs such as My City Academy, we really want to strengthen our office's resource network through education and professional development, not only of ourselves to inform us of the national immigration policies that impact our communities, but also informing city agencies, as well as uh, uh, working in public and private partnerships. Number three is civic engagement. And as Maria just mentioned, we really want you all to get out and take that census if you haven't, but also make sure that you're advocating for others to complete the census as well. So we try to offer programs or opportunities for participation education, such as citizenship programming that we have right now, or our immigrant integration sponsorships, where we really try to reach out to uh, local nonprofits that are working with um, immigrant and, and um, programming, but also trying to engage uh, the receiving community. So folks who may not know as much about immigrant and refugee communities and trying to really bridge that integration. The fourth area is partnerships. So again, many of you are our partners now and we hope to um, meet new partners through uh, this academy and through the services that you are providing. So please again, reach out to myself or Maria about that. And then lastly is research. We really want to increase use of data and community input to inform not only our work, but our ability as a community to be more knowledgeable about how we can increase immigrant integration. And so there are a few uh, resources that we do have available, such as our neighborhood assessment report, which we put out in 2019 at the end of the year. Um, and then most recently, the new American economy um, updated some data around demographics for the immigrant and refugee communities that I'm happy to share as well. And really, I would just say in closing that, you know, we want to make sure that our office is a resource to not only navigators and service providers, but anyone in our communities who uh, need the resources and, and services that the city has to offer. So please stay connected with us. If you have questions, if you have needs, we want to hear from you. Um, I'm very excited about all that you all are going to hear about in this next, uh, these few couple of weeks. And again, I cannot stress enough to really make sure that you reach out to folks who haven't taken the census and remind folks to please take that census. Thank you, Maria. And uh, I hope you all enjoy the, the presentations today. Great, thanks. And next I'd like to welcome Amanda Sawyer, Councilwoman, for District 5. Councilwoman Sawyer is a licensed Colorado attorney and proud neighborhood advocate. Her area covers neighborhoods like East Colfax, Hale, Hilltop, Lowry Field, Montclair, <laughs> Washington, Virginia Vale, and Windsor. Please welcome Councilwoman Amanda Sawyer. Well, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me um, today. This is a fantastic opportunity. I'm so grateful um, that you invited me here to talk a little bit about um, the city of Denver and um, kind of the makeup of how our city works. And so I'm really um, looking forward to uh, this presentation and to kind of talking a little bit about my City Academy and our City of Denver government and the structure of how we work today. So um, I am going to, um, it's gonna sound a little weird as I talk because we have two interpreters who need a couple of minutes to catch up with me as I'm talking. So I'm gonna speak kind of slowly and I am going to take some breaks so that they can catch up. And so, um, like I said, it's gonna sound a little odd as I'm speaking, but um, that is gonna be to give our interpreters a minute to catch up with me here. As we get started, I wanna talk a little bit about um, the history of the city and county of Denver and how, we, how our structure of government started. So Denver became a city and county in 1902. Our charter, which is the governing document for the city of Denver, 
um, was adopted in 1904, but the charter as we know it today was really adopted um, under the Spear Amendment named after um, the guy you see in this picture here uh, in 1916. And um, our city government is called a strong mayor system. It's a strong mayor form of government. And what that means is that our mayor um, is the head of our government and then our agencies sort of sit underneath our mayor and um, then we have some some um, other independent agencies and independently elected bodies uh, like city council that are are on equal footing with our mayor but the the mayor actually sort of makes um, has the decision-making power for all of the agencies that are underneath him. So uh, next slide, please. This is the structure of the city and county of Denver. And you can see the people are at the top. And that's because you're the voters of the city and county of Denver. The second layer down um, of what we're looking at here, these are our independently elected representatives um, so you'll see our district attorney is independently elected, then we have our court system, our mayor, our auditor is independently elected, and our clerk and recorder, city council, and then we have our civil service commission. Um, we also, and then underneath our mayor, you'll see we have our departments, that's um, aviation, finance, um, city attorney's office, general services, those are our departments. Um, that were created by the Denver Charter, and then our offices and our agencies. So um, Office of Children's Affairs, Board of Ethics, all of those uh, offices of agencies and departments are um, report to the mayor's office. And so um, each of those has a head, um, and then all of those report to the mayor who makes the final decisions on kind of how each of those departments work. And then to the right, you'll see we have independent agencies. So those independent agencies are things like the Botanic Garden, the Art Museum, the Museum of Nature and Science. Um, those are independent of the mayor's office in the same way that city council members are independent of the mayor's office. Um, and, but they are, so they are part of the city and county of Denver, but they are run independently um, so for example, the library, things like that. So I will give you a minute to kind of take a look at the structure of the city and county of Denver, but you can see from the way this picture shows, this is why we call it a quote unquote strong mayor system. This is a picture of the city and county of Denver. This is a map of what we um, are like in the city and county. Uh, so you'll see the airport up at the top on the right hand side and then um, you can kind of see each of the council districts uh, and you'll see each of the 13 council members. Um, Denver City Council has uh, 11 council districts so they are equally split up um, by population. So the city is split into 11 council districts by population. This is why it's so important for everyone to fill out the census because every 10 years we redistrict based on population size from that census. So if people aren't filling out the census, then we won't be able to redistrict appropriately based on population size. So we need everyone to fill out the census. So please do that. Um, but those 11 council districts are evenly split based on population throughout the city. And then there are two council members that are at large council members and they represent the entire city as a whole. So you'll see the photos of the 13 council members um, on the right hand side of the map and then you can kind of see how uh, the 11 council districts are split throughout the city. And you'll see that some council districts are really small the smallest land size council district is council district 10. That is um, city center and that is because the city center has the most dense population. Um, and then, you know, council district 11 is the largest in population size and that is to the north and it includes um, the airport where no one lives. So what powers does city council have versus what the mayor have? We talked about we live in a strong mayor system. 
Um, so Denver City Council um, gets its powers from the, the city charter in the same way that the mayor does. Uh, city Council makes the laws. We budget city money. We sit as quasi-judicial off officers, officials who make land use decisions. So for like rezonings, for example. And then we have the power to investigate um, city agencies and employees. What we, um, what we do, how we do that is we have uh, council committees. There are five council committees and each of the mayor's city agencies reports to one of those council committees. And um, so, for example, I sit on two committees. Um, I sit on our safety committee, which deals with um, any city agency that has to do with housing, homelessness, education, or safety. So um, the, all of our police, all of our schools, all of our, um, you know, our housing and stability, Department of Housing Stability, um, those all report to our safety committee. I also sit on our business committee, which is um, any arts um, or workforce or aviation issues. So for example, the airport reports to our um, business committee. So um, you can see how kind of those committees work. There is a land use transportation and infrastructure committee. So all um, rezonings are a department of transportation and infrastructure. They report to what's called LUTI. Um, our finance and governance committee deals with any sort of governing issues, um, any appointments to boards and commissions, um, any any of those kinds of things. So um, though that's how we kind of split up the responsibilities, not only between the 13 council members, but also between all of the agencies um, within the city that report to the mayor. So as I said, one of the major things that city council does is talk about land use. Um, and, and so uh, that's one of the major um, decision-making powers we have as a council. And, and so there are um, very specific plans in place in our city uh, that guide our decisions as council members when it comes to how we want to use our land as a city. And these are really important decisions that we're making because um, when we're talking about land, there's only so much land we as a city have. And um, there's a court decision that was, um, that was the Colorado Supreme Court decided. And that court decision says that the boundaries of the city and county of Denver can never get any larger. And so that means that we can't grow this way. We can only grow this way or we don't grow at all. And um, if we don't grow at all, and people keep coming and wanting to move to the city of Denver, that means we're not gonna have enough housing. And if we don't have enough housing, then the price of the housing that we do have is gonna get higher and higher and higher. And that's concerning because that means people aren't gonna be able to afford to live in our city. So the way we decide to use our land is extremely important because we need to make sure that we're taking into account things like affordability and availability, um, supply and demand, and we're being thoughtful about the decisions that we're making when it comes to land use. Because if we don't, um, we will be getting ourselves into a really dangerous situation down the road um, where we don't have enough housing and we um, and the housing we do have is incredibly expensive. You might know what I'm talking about because we are finding ourselves almost there right now. And that's a real problem um, in our city already. So we have several plans in place um, that have that are the result of several years worth of um, community conversation and feedback that sort of guide our overarching plans as a city. Um, Comprehensive Plan 2040 talks about kind of the, the land use goals of the city. Then we have Blueprint Denver, which talks about our more specific development goals. Um, right now, we are working with our Community Planning and Development Department to go through what's called the NPI process. 
NPI stands for Neighborhood Planning Initiative. And the NPI process um, is going to kind of chunk together neighborhoods. Um, you can see in the map that we're looking at here of the city and county of Denver, um, what is highlighted in green are four neighborhoods that I am currently working on. Um, South Park Hill, Hale, Montclair, and East Colfax. This is the East Area Plan. You might have read about it. But the East Area Plan is part of this NPI process. It's one NPI, one Neighborhood Planning Initiative, um, that will um, create a, neighbor, a, a plan for these four neighborhoods that will sort of guide the way these neighborhoods grow for the next 20 to 30 years. So I was talking about neighborhood plans and the NPI process, um, and I mentioned that there are you know, neighborhoods in Denver. Denver has um, what are called statistical neighborhoods. So statistical neighborhoods were created in the 1970s. Um, these are, there are 78 of them, and you're looking at the map of them right now. So 78 statistical neighborhoods created in the 1970s, these statistical neighborhoods will never change. The reason that they exist is because they're based on, again, really important that you fill out your census, they're based on census tracts. And the information that is provided in these census tracts allows us as a city to track things like population, they allow us to track things, um, data, over time. So we are able to track in these particular statistical neighborhoods all sorts of information from the 70s to today. And this allows us to um, then be able to know how the city has grown um, differently in different places. Um, it allows us to track demographic data and um, data about education and access to opportunity and um, um, income information, all kinds of things like that. It's um, actually really, really important information for things like city planning. So these 78 uh, um, statistical neighborhoods are laid out on the map that you're looking at now. What's really interesting is that there are other neighborhoods in Denver. So um, I'm the councilwoman for District 5, which is East Central Denver. Um, for example, the Hilltop statistical neighborhood that you'll see here includes Hilltop. It also includes a neighborhood called Crestmore. Crestmore is not a statistical neighborhood. Crestmore does not exist anywhere on this map, but everybody sort of knows that Crestmore is a neighborhood of Denver. It's just not a statistical neighborhood. It is included in the Hilltop statistical neighborhood. Here's another example. Um, Mayfair. Everybody knows Mayfair is a neighborhood of Denver. Mayfair is not a statistical neighborhood. Mayfair actually is a neighborhood that straddles the Hale statistical neighborhood and the Montclair statistical neighborhood, but um, it doesn't exist on this map. So it's a very interesting um, way of doing things because over time other neighborhoods have popped up and so they exist in our vernacular in the way we talk about neighborhoods um, commonly, but the way we as a city track neighborhoods, they don't exist. So like I just mentioned, um, this is District 5. You'll see that um, I cover a few different statistical neighborhoods. So Hale, Montclair, East Colfax, Lowry, um, Hilltop, Washington, Virginia Vale, and Windsor are the statistical neighborhoods. And then, um, like I was just saying, you'll see, you know, Mayfair is a neighborhood that kind of straddles Hale and Montclair. Crestmore is a neighborhood that is in, that covers Hilltop as well. Um, you know, there are other neighborhoods that we talk about all the time um, that are in here, but don't, don't actually exist in our statistical neighborhood area. So this is just a, a map of District 5, so, which is the, the section of the city that I know best since it's the part that I represent and live in. So let's talk a little bit about equity and equality in um, the city and county of Denver and what that means and, and how that is important in our, in our jobs as um, council members and what it means to the city of Denver. So this is a very famous picture. And um, on the left-hand side, 
what we're looking at here is equality. Equality is when everyone gets the same thing. And that means that maybe not everyone gets the same result, right? So equality means everyone is given the same opportunity, but everyone's not starting from the same place. So as you can see, there's three gentlemen, um, each of them are a different height in this picture. And on the picture on the left, they're all given the same opportunity, right? They're all given the same box, um, but they didn't start from the same place. And what that means is that they, they're, they, they got the same, they got the same benefits, but they didn't end up in the same place because they didn't start from the same place. So that's a quality, right? Everyone gets the same opportunity, but that doesn't mean that they ended up in the same place because they didn't start from the same place. Equity, on the other hand, is what's represented in the picture on the right. And in the picture on the right, what's important to note is that everyone ended up in the same place because they didn't start in the same place. They didn't get the same benefit, but they all ended up in the same place. And this is a really important picture because this is something that is incredibly important to all of us who work in the city. This is the main focus of the city of Denver. And it is something that we always take into our account in all of the decisions that we make. It's something that we're always thinking about. Um, it's a lens that we always try and consider all of our decisions through um, when we're talking and all of our goals um, when we're talking about the things we want to do in the city and county of Denver. Because we recognize as leaders in our city that not everyone is starting from the same place. So not everyone needs the same opportunities. And in fact, if everyone is given the same opportunities, our residents aren't gonna end up in the same place. And so when we are talking about access to opportunity, when we're talking about how to um, you know, divide up our resources, when we're talking about how to divide our focus and, and where to um, divide our time, we, this is the lens that we are always considering things through. We are always wanting to make sure that we are um, recognizing that our goal and our job is to make sure that we are providing opportunity to the people who need it most so that everyone is ending up at the same place, even though everyone didn't start from the same place. District five is an incredibly interesting district. It's very challenging for me as a leader to represent this um, community because I represent East Colfax, which has the lowest opportunity index score of any neighborhood in the entire city and county of Denver. Um, I also represent Hilltop, which has the highest opportunity index score, one of the highest opportunity index scores of any neighborhood in the entire city and county of Denver. And so when we are talking about, when I am looking at making a decision, when I am talking about um, where I spend most of my time, where I spend most of my resources, where I focus most of my energy, um, it's on East Colfax because I, I am, when I am looking at through a lens of equity, how do I, as a leader, want to make sure that I am leading my community through that lens? It is always, um, you know, I'm always making that decision, focusing on um, my community that needs the most attention and the most resources. Um, so here's just some, you know, as I'm talking about that, here's just some sort of fact sheets that talk about um, the two neighborhoods and kind of the differences between them. Next slide, please. So this is just a little bit, same, same information, same neighborhoods, um, just a little bit of a, a more kind of information about the differences between the two communities. And, and so you can kind of see why it is that I would be spending um, more of my time and energy um, on the East Colfax community than I do on the Hilltop community, given uh, our, our focus on equity in the city and county of Denver. A lot of people say, ask me all the time, kind of how does this, 
how does this work, right? If, if city council makes the laws in the city and county of Denver, how do we do that? How do we change policy? What do we do? How does this work? Um, and, and so on this one sheet of paper, this one slide, right? It makes it look so easy. <laughs> it's not this easy. Um, you know, changing any policy is the result of hundreds and hundreds of hours of research, conversation, um, stakeholder engagement, and, um, you know, back and forth changes um, so many different, there's so many different moving parts and pieces that go into it. But, you know, in general, kind of how does it work? What do we want to do? We talk about, um, you know, we, we work with the agencies. An agency maybe identifies a problem or a resident identifies a problem or a council member identifies a problem. And, you know, then there's a, okay, a, a question. They, you know, fill out a form. We talk about a potential ordinance. We do some research. It goes to the mayor's office. Um, it gets assigned to, you know, someone who does some more research and, and information into it. It goes to committee, um, you know, it goes to, uh, you know, maybe it gets, it gets researched. There's a stakeholder process. And then, um, you know, through committee, it gets approved. It gets sent to mayor council. Um, which is another meeting where we kind of talk about it again. And then um, it ends up on the floor of council. And so if it's a resolution, it's one reading. And then if it's approved, it goes into law when it's signed by the mayor. Um, if it is a bill, it's two readings. And then if it's approved, it goes um, into law. The way it works is you have to have a majority of council members approve it. So seven votes. The mayor can veto, which he's only done once in um, his, I guess at this point, um, that would be nine years in office, which was pit bulls in um, February. It was a big deal. Uh, he's only, that's the only time he's ever used his veto power. Um, but, and then so to, if, if the mayor vetoes a bill, it would take nine council members to override that veto. So in general, seven, a majority, seven members of council, um, the mayor either signs that bill into law then or vetoes it. If he vetoes it, nine members of council would override that veto or not, in which case the veto would stand. Um, but that is how a bill becomes law. So the question is, um, how can you create change in the community? If there's something you want to see change, um, how do you do it? And the question that that's a, it's a, it's a tough question, right? There are a lot of ways to do it. I think uh, all of us have seen what is happening in the city and county of Denver this summer. Um, you know, demonstrations are one way to create change in the community. It is absolutely something that's happening right now. And it's a valuable way to do it as long as it is peaceful. Peaceful demonstrations are one way to create change in the community. Destructive demonstrations are not. Um, so, you know, peacefully demonstrating is one way to do it. Voting is a way to do it. Um, getting out there um, and getting involved is an incredibly important way to do it. City Council in particular, we are very, very open to hearing from our community members. We have public comment every Monday night. It's televised, it's at five o'clock. You can sign up ahead of time. Um, we often have public comment at our committee hearings. So we always welcome um, hearing from people at our committees as well. Um, we always have public comment, public hearings if there are, um, if there's any reason to change a law. So for example, um, if there is, if we are uh, sitting as a quasi-judicial quasi body listening to rezoning, there will always be public comment for anyone who wants to come and comment on that rezoning. Um, there's always public comment if there is, if we are considering um, changing an ordinance or implementing a new um, ordinance of any kind, it's required by our charter that we have public comment. Um, so there are many, many, many opportunities for your voice to be heard 
uh, in our city. And it's really, really important that you engage in that because I think there's a saying, all politics are local. Um, in this day and age, all politics are truly local. And um, so it is so important that you get out there and uh, engage and be a part of it. So um, with that, thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Um, I hope that this was really um, useful to you and gave you a lot of good information. I'm happy to answer any questions. The final slide is just a slide um, saying, you know, if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them now. Otherwise, I really appreciate your time. I'm so grateful. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to come and speak to you today. So Amanda, um, one question that I do have and that I get from a lot of residents are like, what types of things do constituents come and call you about or come and visit you about? Somebody who's just maybe just living in the neighborhood. That's a great question. And the answer is everything. Um, I mean, we get every, every person who wants to have a conversation about anything happening in our city we, comes to us and we answer and everything. I mean, we are truly sort of the um, constituent services arm of the city government. So, so like they have like a anything, of neighbors or? Yep. Anything from my next door neighbor is parking on my lawn and it bothers me to, um, you know, I would really like a stop sign um, on, you know, at this corner because I'm, you know, concerned about the speeding traffic to, um, you know, I, I want to defund the police and I want to, you know, know how to do that or what you're, how you're working on that. Or, you know, I'm concerned about, you know, my trash can that didn't get picked up this week and how do I manage that situation or, and everything in between. Tell us a little bit about how people can pay attention to what's going on in city council. Oh my gosh. Um, that's a great question. So we have, if you go to denvergov.org um, and click on the government tab, um, you can go to the city council page and sign up for our newsletter. Um, there's a main city council newsletter and then every council office sends a newsletter as well, right? And you can follow our social media. Um, I think that's probably the most valuable way to kind of catch up on everything that's going on in, in the city. Um, I think it's a really important way. Of course, you know, these days there is so much information flying at people. It's really hard to keep up on everything. Um, newsletters are an easy way to do that. Um, social media is an easy way to do that because it just sort of like clicks past you every once in a while uh, and you kind of catch up on what's going on. I think the thing that is really hard is that the vast majority of people won't realize something is happening in their neighborhood until it happens. So someone will say, someone will notice um, the house being built next door or scraped next door and then you know a bigger house being built and they will go oh my gosh i didn't know that was happening i want that to stop and by the time that happens it's too late but chances are good that that went through a whole rezoning process and um you know with several opportunities for public comment and you know several opportunities to stop it and you know give input and all of those kinds of things and ask questions and someone just didn't know about it because they weren't you know able to participate for whatever reason and that is really hard because we try to make sure that people are aware of what's going on in the community but it does take a little bit of engagement to do that and so I really do recommend either signing up for a newsletter or participating in, you know, these days with next door, everybody I feel like knows what's going on in their local politics. Um, but, you know, really trying to pay attention just a little bit to those kinds of things, getting involved in your neighborhood organization is really important. Um, there are never enough volunteers in neighborhood organizations. And I think there's probably nothing more important than spending, you know, a couple of volunteer hours getting involved in your neighborhood organization because that's how you know that these things are happening. And 
and it's hard um, and frustrating for the people who do volunteer their time to then get yelled at by people who are like, wait, what? I don't like that when, you know, there were all these opportunities to comment and jump in and, you know, and, and nobody knew. And then everybody's like, we never knew about that. But, but a little, a little involvement would have, would have, you know, let people have that opportunity to, to comment. So I think getting, get involved in the RNO, that's a big one. And just, just do a couple of volunteer hours. Um, it makes a huge difference. Right. And then also city council is available now online since everything with COVID is online. Um, so just if you want to sign up or, you know, just view some of the meetings, they're recorded, they're available live on Monday nights, correct? So city council meetings are on Monday nights at 5 p.m. Um, is public comment and it's televised and then the meetings start at 5.30 um, every Monday night, except for, um, you know, like Labor Day and Memorial Day. It's always available on channel eight, always has been, always will be. Um, hopefully, even when we go back to in-person, when we're not under a public health order anymore, we will still make it available um, via Zoom and it will always be available via Channel 8. So we're working on um, finding opportunities for, for, to allow better access to people. We recognize that m a lot of people, you know, for childcare issues or transportation issues, have a tough time getting downtown on Monday nights at 5.30 p.m. for council meetings. Um, but would like to participate more. So we are working really hard to find better ways to provide more access for our community. Great. So just a few questions have come through. Um, Matthew with Spring Institute, thank you for your question. Can you share the graphic for passing policy through council? Um, we will be sharing the PowerPoint or the slideshow with everyone. Sure. Um, and that'll be sent uh, to all the participants today and then it will also be posted in our my city academy um, page on the for the office of immigrant and refugee affairs um, the other question is what kind of contact do you have or have you had and one of the first times that i met you we were touring the apartment building um, on the east side Garden um, courts. Tell, yeah tell us a little bit about what kind of contact you have with immigrants in your district yeah, great question. So, um, like I said, the vast majority of the time that I spend, um, uh, you know, in the community, I spend up on East Colfax, um, working really, really hard to connect um, the community with resources, right? So that comes in a lot of different forms, not only like, you know, we spent the day up um, with Rocky Mountain communities up at Garden Court Apartments, um, working to, you know, get to know the management of Garden Court Apartments and get to hear the stories of some of the residents up there, understand better the challenges of the community um, and what we can help do within the organizational structure of the city and the, our agencies to help partner better and connect um, the service providers on the ground in the community with the resources that the city has to offer. So, um, you know, like we spent an afternoon doing that. We do that, um, you know, I've done that with a number of different uh, community service providers up there. Um, I have spent um, a, a lot of time working with our police officers up there. Unfortunately, this summer, um, we have had a significant uptick in violent crime in East Colfax. So one of the projects that I have been working on up there has been to work with our Department of Transportation and Infrastructure, um, Excel, and the police department to um, rework, a, to do a pilot project between Willow and Yosemite between 11th and the facts itself um, to re replace all of the lighting in that square um, and then track the crime statistics to see if the brighter lighting will be able to deter some of the crime in that area. If it does, we will um, see if we can expand that to the entire Colfax, East Colfax neighborhood. Um, we also got Excel to donate us 1500 light bulbs to, dis to distribute to the entire community so that we can um, get um, brighter lights to all of the single family homes on the front and back of the houses 
um, to help kind of brighten up the neighborhood. We are working on um, uh, Councilman Herndon, who's in District 8 to the north of East Colfax and I are working on a um, legislative rezoning of the neighborhood for ADUs and we're working, there's a super cool company in California that we're trying to see if we can um, either um, get them to come here or emulate them. But what they do is a mo they're like a modular ADU company where they will come in and actually do uh, affordable, they lease the housing, the, the backyards and put ADUs in modular ADUs in backyards and then actually find the tenants. So it's a wealth building um, and affordable housing structure because they do it for 99, they do the leases for 99 years and um, lease them for affordable, only for affordable units. Um, capital A affordable units. It's super neat. There's a ton of different things we're working on writing a applying for a grant up there um, for foot patrols um, to help with some of the crime deterrence. I mean, there's a ton of stuff I'm doing up there, but vast majority of my time and energy is spent up there. We have donated um, funds to all of the um, food banks of, for all of the different affordable housing providers up there to help um, bring food services to the community. I mean, all kinds of, tons of stuff. Are there systems to provide help to people who lack documentation? And, and this is a question we'll be answering throughout all of the seminars or all of the webinars. Is there help without fear of separation? And where can I learn more about public charge? So public charge information, I'll take, I'll let a team cover that question. Yeah, you know what, and, and I just want to say, you know, I'm going to let a team um, take that question. And I want to thank you for all of the work that you guys do. You are, the fear is, is real and you are doing a fantastic job of supporting our community in that. So thank you for all you're doing. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you, Council and Sawyer. Um, so I will just say very quickly, in about a minute, there are resources that we will hopefully uh, forward on uh, with a follow-up email. Uh, but our website has some information about public charge, and public charge is definitely a concern in our community, so I'm glad for the question. Um, in terms of, of, you know, accessing resources, um, if you do not, or if, if someone lacks uh, immigration status, um, we do have some resources, and really all resources are, um, are available in city and county of Denver for, for all residents. Um, and so I would, because of time, I would um, actually like that person to reach out to Maria and we can really kind of engage in what that looks like. Um, but again, that is, that is what our office is, is supposed to be um, used as a resource to really assist anyone who has that concern. Um, but in, in general, um, all city and county uh, resources um, based on some additional qualifications should be accessible uh, to all, regardless of immigration status. Um, but I'm happy to, to discuss uh, with the individual who asked that specific question.